Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Today we'll be talking about understanding the nature of God. Understanding the nature of God. Why is it important for us to understand the nature of God? Well, we're going to find out. So I want us to begin to understand that today, particularly, is going to be a lot of teaching. And by the grace of God, it goes into preaching. And however, the Spirit of God leads. Amen. So which means that I want us to please write down whatever we hear and pay careful attention. Let's look at the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. We understand that it says that God created us in his own image. He said, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Amen. God said, let us make man in our image. There, it is not by accident that you and I are created in the image of God. We are created in the image of God because God wants us to look like him. He wants you to look like him in nature. Amen. He wants you to look like him, live like him, and lead like him. Amen. That is why he created you in his image. I know we've shared this here before. The image, when you talk about the image, you're talking about a direct resemblance of a thing. Like when you have a material, you cut it out from the supermarket, you bring the piece, a direct image of whatever you have. Amen. So God has created you to look like him. And it's not an accident. He said in his likeness. So you can function like him. He said to take dominion. Why? Because he is a God that dominates all this earth. Hallelujah. So it is not an accident that you and I are created the way God created us. There's a purpose for it. Amen. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, there's a purpose why I was created. Amen. Let's look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. We begin to see why we were created, understanding the nature of God. He says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So there was a wisdom, there was a mystery that was ordained before you and I came into existence. And what is this mystery? So there was a mystery that God kept, there was a secret that God kept aside. Praise the Lord. So your creation has been planned way before the foundations of this earth. And there was a purpose for it. And I want us to begin to understand that. Because the more you understand the purpose why you're created, the more you begin to look like him, live like him, and lead like him. Amen. No wonder the Bible says, in him we move, we live, and we have our being. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It says, but we speak the, the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now let's look at the book of 2 Peter 1 from verse 3 to 4. We begin to see what is this mystery that the Bible is talking about. What is this mystery? He says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things pertaining unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. Did we hear what I just said? He said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by this ye might be partakers of his divine nature. Hallelujah. God has created you. He has prepared you. He has promises. Why? Because he wants you to be a partaker of his divine nature. He wants you to share his divine nature. Amen. So there is a reason God wants you to share his divine nature. He says, have, he says having shared the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. So God has created you at such a time like this. He has prepared you. He has made promises and provisions that you and I will share his divine nature. So as a child of God, what is the nature of God that you share, that we share in common? The Bible says that ye are gods. 
Even as we serve the Lord God Almighty, we are God's because we are begat of God. Amen. So if he is God, he has a nature and we also have that nature inside of us. If you do not have the nature of God inside of you, then the spirit of God does not live inside of you. It's only the spirit of God that begins to manifest all the attributes of the nature of God. Praise the Lord. So you have to understand the nature of God, then you begin to function like God. Amen. No wonder the Bible says that the world awaits the manifestations of the sons of God. They are awaiting the manifestations of the nature of God. Amen. God is not going to appear in the heavens. He's not going to walk on the streets of Canton, but he wants to express himself through you. God wants you and I to be his billboard. Amen. You know, in this world, the devil and God, they are in competition of who rules this earth. We know that devil is the prince of this earth, but God is the head of all principalities. Amen. And you are begat of the head of all principalities. And he's seeking to express himself on this earth. He says, he created you for this reason. There are promises, there are principles prepared so that you can partake of his divine nature. So that when the world sees you, they see God. When people see you, they see God. When they see you, they understand the nature of God that you serve. No wonder most of us, when we say we are Christians, people look at us and say, how are you a Christian? Why? Because there are some natures of God that you need to carry in the inside of you. Amen. And the more you carry it, the more it becomes expressive to everybody around you. Hallelujah. Are you following me, church? The nature of God is inside of you and I. Every single person sitting here today. God created you for a reason. He created you because he wants the world to see him. He wants the world to see who he is, his nature and the things that he can do. But he cannot do it by himself. He needs a man. He needs you. He needs I. He needs us all together so that he can express himself. So it is important that we begin to understand his nature and begin to check ourselves and see, do we conform to the nature of God? Are people looking at us and they can say, surely these are children of God. Amen. The Bible says that the disciples, you know, it, 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 the disciples were called Christians. Why? Because they were Christ-like. They behaved like Christ. They were walking and everything about them. They just said, these guys look like Christ. So we call them Christians. Amen. So if you are a child of God, you are a son of God, people should look at you and say, indeed, this is a child of God. Why? Because I see the nature of God in the inside of you. Hallelujah. So to this morning, we're going to discuss four major nature of God. Just four. Praise the Lord. The first one is love. Can somebody say love in the house? Hallelujah. The Bible says that God is love. God is love. If you don't have love, you don't have God. It's as simple as that. If you do not have love in your heart, if there's no space in you to love anybody around you, then you don't carry the nature of God. Because it only takes the spirit of God to express itself in the inside of you. And the Bible says that God is love. Which means that we are bound to love. Amen. Let's look at some scriptures before we begin. Let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 22 from 36 to 40. God is love. He says, Master, he was asked the question. You know, like we all seek here, we all want to do right by God. We all want to please God. And a question was posed unto him. He said, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? I don't know how many of us are sitting here today. We're talking to ourselves or asking people, what is the greatest commandment that can please God? 28. Jesus said, Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Amen. You shall love the Lord of God, Lord our God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's not all. 38. He said, this is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. I didn't hear amen. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the greatest commandment in the Bible. And it is the nature of God. Many of us are incapable of loving people. 
you begin to check yourself. Are you a carrier of the nature of God? It says the greatest commandment, the second is like unto the first. Many of us claim that we love God, but you don't love your neighbor. You love God. You don't love the next person around you. Your neighbor is that immediate person around you at that very, very point in time. It's not your neighbor at home. Whoever is sitting next to you right now is your neighbor. Amen. Whoever comes to you right now in need is your neighbor. And the Bible is saying that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And that is the greatest commandment. The greatest. If you do that alone, you're all set. But the devil is very tricky. Because that's why most of us have hate in our hearts. It is impossible to love because of what people do to us. We have so many justifications why we can't love. Yes, by the worldly standard, it passes. But not by the spiritual standard. Because you are born of God. You have in the inside of you the nature of God. The spirit of God expresses that love regardless to whoever is around you. Amen. Let's look at the book of First John chapter 4 verse 20. Love is a powerful tool. He says, if a man say, this is what the Bible is saying, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. The Bible says, let every man be a lie and let God be true. God we serve a God that never lies. He says, if a man, he says, if a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he had not his brother for he that loved not his brother whom he had seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? You do not love God. You love God that you haven't seen, but yet the brother that is next to you, you are incapable of expressing love unto them. The Bible says that you are a liar. If you are seated in this house today and you lift up your holy hands and you say you love God, but then you have somebody around you that you hate, the Bible has just called you a liar. I didn't call you a liar. You are a liar and you don't carry the image of God inside of you. That means that you're void of the nature of God that is inside of you. This is a commandment. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It is important as Christians, as people who are carriers of the nature of God to express love everywhere we are. People should look at you and begin to see the love of God in the inside of you. Amen. In your job places, in your family, in your homes, in your relationships, anywhere you are. There is no mitigation, there is no limit to the extent of love that you share unto people. Why? Because you carry the nature of God in the inside of you. And if you carry the nature of God inside of you, he gives you the grace to express the love of God regardless of the situation. Amen. So you check yourself at your job place. How many people do you hate? How many people hate you? In your family, how many people love you? How many people do you hate? And you are a Christian and you understand the nature of God? Then you're void of the nature of God. That's what the Bible is saying. For you to be a carrier of the nature of God, you love regardless. Praise the Lord. Let's look at the book of First Corinthians. Some people might say, okay, I hear that, but who do we love? Who do we love? You see, the world has standards and definitions of love. But the Bible has its own set principles when it comes to love. 1 Corinthians 13, from verse 1. Praise the Lord. Are you following me, church? He said, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and I have no... Give me NIV, because when charity there stands for love. He said, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have no love, I am become a sounding brass. Okay, this is NIV. Praise the Lord. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal. So for those of us who are so spiritual, who speak in tongues from our sleep, when you're sleeping and when you wake up, before you eat, you speak in tongues. If you say fly, you speak in tongues. Whatever happens to you, you speak in tongues. Praise the Lord. The Bible is saying you can speak in tongues and be so spiritual. If you have no love, you're nothing but a sounding gong. You can speak in tongues and all earth bow when you speak in tongues. The Bible says if you have no love, it's meaningless unto him. Two. 
He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can phantom all mystery and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountain but do not have love, I am nothing. Be ye a minister of the gospel. You speak, fire comes from heaven. You call in fire, it comes down from heaven. You ask mountain to move and they move. But you have no love. The Bible says you are nothing. You do all those because there's a gifting that has been given unto you. But you're void of the nature of God. It is only when you have the nature of God. It's like a magnetic force. You have the nature of God that attracts God himself. So if you're void of that nature, how do you attract God? How do you get in contact with God? How do you relate with God because you're void of his nature? Amen. He says here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how well gifted you are. It doesn't matter how well you serve in the church. It doesn't matter if you're in the choir, in the media. Every, it does not matter. If you have no love, you are nothing before God. If you like, come to church every split second. Every split minute, and you serve and you worship, and you think you're a pastor, an apostle, a bishop, the Bible says you are nothing. Why? Because you're void of the nature of God. You don't have the nature of God inside of you. Praise the Lord. You don't look like Him as He created you, you don't function like Him, you don't lead like Him. That means there's a problem. There's a disconnect. There's a glitch in the system because there's no connection between you and him. Even though you do all this is in his name, but you do not carry his nature. The Bible says you are nothing. And if you are nothing before God, that means you're not destined to stay with him. You're a child of God in this house. You've been a Christian for 50, 100 years. You can love your neighbor you can't love the next person around you. In your job place, people see you and there's anger. You have envy, hatred, anger inside of you. It is not in nature of God. You know, one day I was just thinking, how do you have this nature of anger, hatred, and lack of love? When you go to heaven, what happens? Does the spirit take it away from you? It doesn't because you never had it in the first place. You never had the nature of God in the first place. There's a force field that will bounce you back from entering heaven. Why? Because you do not qualify. You don't have what takes you or transports you into the presence of God. And that is the nature of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Do I have someone in this house today? Yes. You need to love God. Let's quickly look at also the book of first. No, let's keep going. Don't change. Go to three. He says, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. There are many that can donate their lives. You can fund the work of the ministry. You can bless God, build churches for God. But you have no love. It is useless. That's what the Bible is saying. It doesn't matter how much you support the children of God or the work and the vision of God. You have not this nature of God. It is useless. Let's go to four real quick. He said, what is love then? Many of us ask, them, so what is this love we're talking about? The Bible said, love is patient. Love, being patient means it's enduring. It's tolerant. That's what it's telling you. It is patient. When people wrong you, love is patient to act. He said, love is kind. This is the Bible describing what love is. Having the nature of God. We're not going by the standards of the world. We're going by what the Bible is saying. He said, it is patient. So if you know you're sitting here today and you lack patience, you got to check yourself again. Praise the Lord. Because love is patient. I know someone say, oh, that person so hurt me. I can't take it. But love is patient. Because it covers multitude of sin. That's what love does. He said, love is kind. And when love is kind, it's not just in action, but also in your speech. When you speak to people, you speak kindly unto them. Conscious of the fact that you might hurt them. Why? Because you ask yourself, how would God relate with that person? And if you are a child of God, you carry the nature of God, is that how God will act? 
you're boastful, you're prideful, you can never be, God can never reside in the vessel, which is you. Praise the Lord. Because the Bible says that God resists the pride. So the problem of a proud man is God and not the situation around you. Because God himself has said, I will resist you. Why? Because you're proud. So you don't think you're better than anybody. Because God has put you there. You should be humble and you should be appreciative of the fact that God has empowered you to where you are. Amen. And it doesn't mean you should talk down on people around you, but show them love. Hallelujah. The nature of God. Love. I almost want to stay here all day, but we need to move on. Praise the Lord. How many of us have the love of God in our hearts? How many of us have the love of God in our hearts? The Bible has described what love is. It is for you to check within yourself and say, what is this love? Am I truly loving? Amen. The second nature of God that we're going to talk about is forgiveness. Praise the Lord. The second nature we're talking about is forgiveness. Let's look at the book of Matthew, chapter 6, from verse 14. It says, For if you forgive another people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive. Amen. For some of us, it is impossible for you to forgive. You see, unforgiveness is a spiritual ceiling that is over your head. And the devil uses it every time against Christians who do not forgive. The Bible says if you do not forgive, then God cannot forgive you. Praise the Lord. This is a serious offense before God. Because he took out his time to forgive you of all your sins, of all your iniquities. Every time you commit sin against him, he forgives you. The same expectation is required of you. Praise the Lord. That was why Peter went to Jesus Christ and asked him, um, say, Master, how many times should we forgive our brother when they sin against us? Do you notice he answered it quickly? He said, seven how do you ask a question and you want to answer it at the same time? But Jesus said, no, no, not seven. Seventy times seven times. I can imagine Peter saying, say what now, God? 490 times in a day? How possible can I forgive that much? 490 times you are required as a child of God to forgive. I want to announce to you that we are nothing but professional forgivers. Just as you have doctors that work within the confines of their rules and regulation. Just as you have nurses, wherever you walk, there are rules and regulations where you walk. Also in the kingdom of God, this is a profession for you. You are required to forgive. Irrespective of what has happened to you. Irrespective of whatever anybody has done to you. It doesn't matter the legal standing against you. As a child of God, having the nature of God... You are a professional forgiver. Do you hear me, house? It is your duty as a child of God to forgive regardless. If you're incapable of forgiving, God is incapable of forgiving you. That was why when Jesus was teaching them, uh, 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 is it the Lord's Prayer? He said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it's in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as. <laughs> Many people will pause right there. Because they can't repeat that word. You dare not repeat that word because you're talking to the king of kings and the lord of lords. Say, forgive us our trespasses as. As what? I, I know I'm saying, are you qualified to say that? You can imagine the angels waiting to hear you say what when you don't forgive. How dare you repeat that prayer when you don't forgive? You see, I say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. That's the justification. You come before God and say, God, because I have obeyed you, I have forgiven, therefore God, you can forgive me. So if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you're not qualified to say those prayers. You are not qualified to say, God, forgive you. He said, forgive us our trespasses as we, as we it's not a, it, it is your profession, it is your right, it is your duty to forgive regardless. And because that is the nature of God. Praise the Lord. 
God forgave you all the things you did. He translated it from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. He sacrificed his only son, Jesus Christ, for your sake. And you say, somebody, change your situation around. Somebody's the reason why you're where you are today. At your job place, there are a lot of people you can't forgive because you're holding them in your heart. You know, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the right person to die. Because you're killing yourself in the inside. You drink poison and you're looking at the person waiting for them to die. No, you're killing yourself. Why? Because you have problem with God. Praise the Lord. If you're incapable, as you sit here in this house, to forgive, there's a problem. Because you're void of the nature of God. You're supposed to be a carrier of the nature of God. The Bible says that we are partakers and sharers of his divine nature. And his nature is a nature of forgiveness. So where, where is it that you get unforgiveness as a child of God? How dare you not forgive? Praise the Lord. It might be hard, but you're a professional forgiver. <laughs> you know, doctor, sometimes it's hard. There are some decisions you make as a doctor. Why? Because it's within the scope of your duty. So it might be hard for you. It's within the scope of your duty to forgive regardless. You forgive your family, your sibling, your children, your parents, your uncles, your neighbors, that friend, that, that ex that has hurt you. You do it for your own sake. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that when you are bringing an offering unto God, let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 22. It says, when you are bringing an offering unto God, when you are bringing a gift before him, you say, but I say unto you, when you are, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, Raka is foolish. When you curse at your brother, you know that, right? When you say ill words against your brother, praise the Lord, shall be in danger of the cancel. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. You know why this is so? Because everything we do is from our hearts. It doesn't matter what you say to me as a pastor or to any pastor here today. You can come to and say, I have forgiven, that's fine. But God is a discerner of the intents of your heart. He says, guide your heart with all diligence because out of it emanate all the issues of life. That person you harbor and imprison your heart. As you're praying unto God, he's looking at the prisoner in your heart. And he's calling you a prisoner and then you request of him things. He said, when you come before him to give an offering or a gift and you remember that you hurt somebody, or somebody has a heart against you. He said, leave your offering. That is how powerful unforgiveness is. The Bible says, I do not need your offering. I don't need you. I don't need what you have to give to me. He said, leave it there. Go back and reconcile. Then you can bring your offering unto me. He doesn't need your offering. Why? Because it cannot go through. Praise the Lord. Because you're not operating or functioning in the nature of God. And yet you come before him to offer him what? He looks at you. There's a barrier of unforgiveness all around you. Nothing can ever justify it. Why? Because you're a professional forgiver. So in everything you do in life, you must forgive. It's a commandment. It's a law. Praise the Lord. It's a law of the kingdom. Hallelujah. How many Christians do we have in this house? Can you please put your hands together if you're a Christian in this house? How many of us want to live a life of Christ in this house? Please put your hands together. How many of us have the nature of God in the inside of us? If you're void of love, if you're void of forgiveness, the Bible says you're nothing. He even qualifies that you go to hell. Praise the Lord. It is a serious thing to be a member of this great kingdom. You have to understand the nature of the king of the kingdom and operate similar. Amen. My time is running out. Let's quickly go to the next one. Praise the Lord. Generosity and in giving. Let's look at the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 19.
Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. He says, my God shall supply all my needs. Praise the Lord. He says, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. How many of us love that prayer? How many of us want to say this prayer? How many of us want God to supply his need according to his riches in glory? If you're here, can you raise your hand up, please? God, God bless you. Amen. But you see, if you go ahead before that scripture, the Bible says that Paul was talking to the Philippians. Because they gave unto him and gave unto the ministry, it is only then you can say that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. If you are seated here today and you do not give unto the things of God, you do not give to the next person around you, you can't, say, can't make that prayer. That prayer was because they gave. It is the nature of God to give. God showed us the first example by giving Jesus Christ, the only son that he has. He gave his Jesus Christ and he gained every one of us. Praise the Lord. You see, it is not possible to love without giving. They go hand in hand. You give when you love. So your giving is also an expression of love to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is a nature of God that is required of you and I. That we love, that we forgive, and that we become givers. You give to your neighbor in need, you give to the ends of the ministry, then you are fulfilling the nature of God. Then that prayer comes alive in the inside of you. Amen. Then God begins to see that you've given. That's why he said, give and it shall be given to you. Good measures, praise down, shaking together and running all over shall men give unto you. But he first said, give, it shall. Give because you gave and it's because you gave, it shall be given unto you. Praise the Lord. If you don't give, you don't release, how do you receive? Most of us are stingy. We hold things to ourselves. We don't want to give to people around you. You know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ, they came to him one day, you know, and that when he was sick, nobody came to see him. When he was hungry, nobody fed him. And they asked him, they said, Master, when did this happen that we didn't do this? He said, because you didn't do it to any one of these ones around. Because you didn't do it to your neighbor around, you haven't done it unto him. You see your neighbor in need and you have and God has given unto you. If you give, you're giving unto uh, an image of God. So you're giving unto God. You can't give God. You can't see God and give God as a person. There's nothing you can give unto him. But the only time that you satisfy giving is when you give to people around you and you give towards his work. Praise the Lord. Then shall his bosom be opened unto you and I. And the Lord begins to lavish you with all the blessings. God begins to lavish you with all the promises that he has made for you and I. Amen. But he requires you to give. You know, there was a story I heard about somebody who, who was so stingy. Uh, you know, he fell into the pool and they were trying to pull him out. And somebody was saying, give me your hand, give me your hand. And he held his hand down and he was dying and he was going down. And his best friend was around there when he was, you know, drowning. And they kept saying, give me your hand. You know, people that are stingy, they hold their hand tight. His friend that came and said, what are you saying? Wait, take my hand. <laughs> when they said, take my hand, he stretched out. He reached out and they pulled him out of there. Amen. <laughs> Many of us don't give. We are just, you know, we are takers. You're not a giver, but you're a taker. You will drown and you will die. Why? Because there's no hand for anybody to grab and pull you out. But givers always stretch forth. Givers always stretch forth. And God will see your hand and pull you out of that mess that you're in. Why? Because you've given. Praise the Lord. These are the principles of the nature of the king that you serve. And it is a requirement that you and I should have the same nature in the inside of us. First Peter says that we are partakers of this nature. If you are a partaker of this nature and you have the indwelling of the Spirit of God in the inside of you, then you must love. Then you must forgive. Then you must be a giver. When you have it, you know the Bible says when you have something and your neighbor comes and you have it and you don't give is a sin. Sin simply means missing the standard of God. That's God's standard. It's God's requirement. That you miss it alone, you've missed it. 
Praise the Lord. The nature of God. Many of us can love. I can't, I can't understand it. You can't forgive. I know there are things that are hurtful that men do unto us. There are things that people do unto you. But remember that God wants to fight your battle. He says, he said, be still for the battle is mine, says the Lord. When you go ahead and fight this battle, you're in his way. Praise the Lord. So when you have unforgiveness, you're in his way for him to react on your behalf. Because you've already stepped in and he steps back. Why? Because he shares no glory with no man. He doesn't want to stay behind you and then you're successful and then you say you did it yourself. He's a jealous God. He's giving you the principles on how he can fight for you. He said, forgive, then step out of the way. Let me handle it. Praise the Lord. But most of us are incapable of forgiving. That is a lie of the devil over your life in the name of Jesus. Most of us are incapable of loving. That is the nature of God in itself. When you love, you will forgive. When you love, you will be a giver. Praise the Lord. Let me quickly check the last one. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3. I'm going to speed through this. The nature of God is holiness. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. Praise the Lord. God cannot relate with you if you're not holy. Now he says, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The devil is always, the angel is before the Lord. A whole high priest. And Satan, if Satan can stand beside the high priest, how much more you and I? Satan stood there. To resist him of every good thing God wants to give unto him. To resist him from receiving from the Lord. To resist him from every relationship and contact that he has with God. Why? Let's look at verse 3. And the Lord said unto them. No, 3. He said, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. The only justification and legal ground the enemy had against the high priest was because he had filthy garments upon him, which is the sin that we have upon ourselves. That's what the Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. A lion begets a lion. A tiger begets a tiger. So a holy one begat a holy one. An unholy one begat an unholy one. Amen. A liar begets a liar, and the king of truth begets truth. Amen. A high priest was resisted. A high priest was resisted. Why? Because of the filthy garment that he had on. And he could not receive of the Lord. Even though there were angels around him to bless him and to give him everything that he had sought before God. But because he was out of place and out of alignment with God, he could not resist it. It's only when God rebuked the, 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 rebuked the devil and casted out the filthy garment was he able to receive from the Lord. So the nature of God is the nature of holiness. If you have love in your heart, you have forgiveness, you're a giver and you stay holy, you are indeed a God upon this earth. Amen. Finally, just before I go, let's look at the book of Hosea chapter 4 from verse 6 to 7. Are you blessed in this house? Jose, now I want us to take this real quick. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. <laughs> His people, the children of God, you and I seated here today, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Today, the Lord has used me to minister to us to give you knowledge. It is only when you do not conform or take this knowledge that you're being destroyed. You bring upon yourself the destruction. The Bible says that they, yes, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He said, because you have rejected, which means there is a deliberate intention for you to reject knowledge. You refuse the knowledge. He said, because you have rejected it, I will also reject you. He said, and thou shalt not be a priest unto me. Praise the Lord.
I pray that as you have heard this word, that the nature of God will be to begin to form in your life in the name of Jesus, that in your bowels will spring out the nature and the power of God. Amen. I pray that the spirit and the grace of God will be available unto you to break every unnatural force of God over your life in the name of Jesus. That the nature of God will be built and formed in the inside of you. Hallelujah. If you're void of this nature of God, you can never be of God. And if anything happens within now and when this nature is formed, you can't make it to where he is. Have a resemblance in you. Amen. Shall we all rise and pray? Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit us at Fountain of Grace, 427 Turnpike Street, Canton, Massachusetts, 02021. Or give us a call at 781-821-1121. Or feel free to give us an email at admin at fountainofgracebos.org. Or visit us at our website at www.fogbos.org.